welcome, Bastian. Uh, it's great to have you in the uh, in the Amsterdam Leadership Lab. Um, so I really kind of made it easy for myself and put all the information in this uh, in this slide about you. But uh, for <laughs> for those that have uh, have already figured it out, this is all about Bastian. So you can see uh, some things about about where he. Uh, did his PhD, which was in Tilburg, uh, where he works, which is also in Tilburg since last year, I understood. Um, he was a visitor at Princeton, so you can see that up there, and did a research internship at Max Planck Institute and an undergraduate at the University of Cologne. Um, so research is about social perception and decision making, which is a little bit broken up in the puzzle, but it's in there. Um, and especially you study faces, um, which you do in different ways. And I saw you do use classification algorithms, face morphing. Uh, you also do economic games and all the other words that you see there are about your interests, uh, which include, for instance, cooperation, evolution, which we find very interesting here as well, and trust. So that's a little bit of background. Um, we had a little bit of overlap in, uh, in Tilburg when I was working there, and you were doing uh, your PhD. And it's it's really nice to have you here in a different location uh, to say hello again and to hear more about what you've been doing uh, lately. So I'd like to hand over the word to you. But uh, before that, we, what we do, um, what we started doing last time in these virtual meetings is that people can ask questions through the chat uh, function. So that um, otherwise it becomes a bit messy in a virtual presentation like this. And then at the end, uh, we can pick up on those questions and, uh, and I can facilitate if, uh, if that's helpful. Or you can just uh, go to the chat and answer the questions yourself, whatever you uh, prefer, Bastian. That sounds yeah, good. Yeah? Yeah. yeah? Okay, with that, I'll, uh, I'll remove this. Everyone solved it by now, and you can, uh, I'll hand you the, uh, the word. So I'm going to try to set this up so that I can share my screen with you guys. Excellent. Yes. And yep, I will possible. move your faces to my secondary screen. Let's see if that works. Uh, which also means so I um, I'm sometimes maybe cannot see the chat function or I will not see uh, any questions that you might have. So if you have any clarification questions during the talk, um, I'm totally fine um, that you can maybe just unmute yourself and just ask away because I know there's a virtual hand you can raise in Zoom, but I might not see that. Um, so if, if anything is unclear during the talk, um, you can just unmute yourself and ask away. And um, otherwise, for more complex questions, content questions, at the end, I think we have some time for, for questions. Okay, so, well, thanks a lot for inviting me. It's too bad that we have to do this virtually and I actually can't come to Amsterdam right now. Um, but I'm still excited to show you some of the projects I've been working on in the past um, maybe half year. So these are all very recent projects that I'm still working on. And um, yeah, I'm really curious um, what your comments are. Um, and these, I think that the common focus of these two projects that I wanna show you is to dive a bit more into more complex relationships between facial appearance and decision-making. And I think what um, overall these results suggest is that the typical way in which we study how people rely on first impressions, how people rely on facial appearance when making decisions, for example, when choosing leaders, and I know that you guys are very interested in that question, for example, um, might be too simplistic, so we might miss out on more complex relationships with the kind of methodological and statistical tools that we're normally using. Um, can everyone see my presentation? Is that all good? Yeah. Okay. Well, as Wendy already mentioned, uh, most of my research focuses on first impressions from faces. So I study what kind of facial features people rely on to form impressions of how trustworthy or how dominant or how intelligent a person is. Um, so this is actually the perfect setup in Zoom right now. So I see some of you for the first time. I see most of your faces and nothing else. Um, but even in real life, when people have access to all different kinds of visual input, we know that they um, rely on a person's facial features to kind of judge their trustworthiness or dominance, for example. And we also know that these judgments are formed very spontaneously and effortlessly, so it only takes about 100 milliseconds of exposure to a person's face, and we have some intuition of um, how trustworthy we think they are, for example. 
Um, and there's also some agreement across different perceivers. So people somewhat agree on what a trustworthy person looks like if we analyze different judgments from different cultures or different age groups, for example, um, even though there are also large individual differences here. And maybe most importantly, what a lot of previous studies have shown, and this is also what I want to focus on today, is that these impressions from faces are very consequential. So they influence a lot of different decisions. Um, so people rely on their first impressions when they decide whom to vote for, whom to select as a leader, um, who is found guilty in court. So there are many domains um, of social life in which a person's facial appearance influences their social outcomes. And the way these effects are usually studied is um, pretty similar across different studies. So maybe I'm interested in looking at how facial masculinity versus femininity, so how masculine or feminine someone's facial features are, how that influences their likelihood of being selected as a leader. So that's a very typical question in the literature. So I might in manipulate um, facial masculinity in faces and I see how that influences people's leader choices. Um, I might also have some hypotheses regarding what is driving these effects. So maybe I assume or maybe even directly test that masculine faces are seen as more dominant than feminine faces. And maybe that can explain this effect on leader choice because in some domains, people might prefer dominant leaders. So this is basically the, the general model in which these effects are studied, in which we understand the influence of facial appearance on decision making. We're typically focusing on one or maybe a few facial cues. Um, we examine their effects on decision making. And maybe we also examine whether certain inferences, such as judgments of trustworthiness or dominance, how these inferences mediate this, this role. And what I want to argue today and show you some, some data um, is that maybe this model is a bit too simplistic to capture all of the different complex relationships between a person's facial appearance and the kinds of behaviors that, that we're interested in, kinds of decisions where people might rely on facial appearance. And specifically, I want to make or I want to show you data that kind of suggests two complexities in this, project, in this process. So on the one hand, I want to show you data that suggests that if we perceive a person's face, even if we just look at the influence of one facial cue, um, these features can activate multiple inferences at the same time. So multiple stereotypes might become activated um, from looking at a person's face. And these inferences all co-determine a person's decision, which also means that if maybe incompatible stereotypes become activated, if they have opposite um, they have opposite effects on the decision-making process. These might actually cancel out. So if I just look at the effect of that facial cue on decisions, I might not observe any significant relationship whatsoever. But that does not mean that this facial cue is actually unimportant for this decision-making process. It might simply be the case that in this situation, this facial cue triggers opposite stereotypes that basically wash out on average if I look at the overall effect. And the second um, aspect I want to focus on today is that when we perceive a person's face, we perceive multiple facial cues at the same time. So we perceive their gender, um, we perceive how age typical they look, we perceive their race, we perceive their facial width to height ratio, and all these other different facial cues that have been studied in the literature. And the problem is that many of these facial cues are related, so it's really hard to disentangle their unique effects. So it's really hard to figure out which facial cues are actually central in impression formation and also in decision-making if we think that these impressions actually have consequences for the kinds of decisions people are making. So these are the two kind of complexities or um, modeling problems that I want to focus on today. And in the first project, um, I wanted to look at a situation where we might see that the same facial features that we would be interested in studying, so how masculine or feminine a person looks, um, I, wanted to, I was interested in testing whether this simple cue can actually trigger multiple inferences in a person's mind with, with um, both inferences or with all of these inferences co-determining or all, all of them influencing the decisions that we might make based on those inferences. 
And this research was basically inspired by the dynamic interactive model of person construal. So this is a model by John Freeman and Nalini Ambari that they propose to model the complex relationships between different kinds of cues, for example, voice cues, facial cues, and so on, and how people categorize the gender or sexual orientation of a person. But I think it's also very applicable here in understanding and how different facial cues trigger different sorts of inferences because what this model kind of acknowledges or um, highlights is that we perceive all of these facial cues and these facial cues might activate different kinds of stereotypes in our minds. And together, these inferences, these stereotypes, co-determine the decisions for me. Now, this is all maybe a bit too abstract, so let me just give you a more concrete example. So again, imagine you're interested in studying how facial appearance influences leader choice. So we might be interested again in studying how the masculinity or femininity of facial features has an influence here. So these are all facial cues that are seen as um, feminine that are kind of prompting us to perceive a face as feminine. So one prediction that we might make is we know that if you look more gender typical, then your gender category becomes activated more strongly. So people have an easier time correctly identifying a woman as a woman if she has typically female facial features. Um, we also know that typically leaders are associated with men, not with women. So this stronger activation of the female category might actually have a negative influence on leader choice. So we would here maybe predict that women with feminine facial features as opposed to more masculine facial features might not be preferred as leaders. However, we can also come up with a competing prediction here. So we know that in women, feminine facial features are seen as attractive compared to more masculine facial features. And we also know that generally attractive people get a lot of different benefits. They're typically seen as more competent, um, better, almost better people in general. So maybe attractive people are also seen as better leaders. There's, for example, data showing that attractive politicians um, have an advantage in elections. So again, what this model and what this, this line of reasoning suggests is that um, the same facial cue here, facial femininity, can trigger two different stereotypes that have opposite influences on this behavior that we're interested in. And maybe the overall effect is zero, even though we see these complex relationships between these cues, the inferences, and the behavior that we're interested in. So this is exactly what we wanted to test in this first study. And we didn't look at um, leader choice, but we looked at how um, well people perceive certain targets to fit into a typically male job. So we asked them, um, how good of an engineer would this person be just from looking at their face? Um, so we looked at kind of job fit ratings as an engineer to look at uh, kind of these stereotypes in the work domain. And again, what we would predict here is that feminine facial features should lead to decreased perceived job fit in the, in the domain of, of judging engineers because of the stereotype that we link engineers with the concept of men rather than women. However, we could also predict exactly the opposite. So maybe feminine facial features increase the perceived job fit here because of attractiveness stereotypes. So feminine facial features are seen as more attractive for women. So they're perceived as more attractive and attractive people are typically favored in all different kinds of domains. Maybe they're also seen as better engineers. Now for men, we would have slightly different predictions here. So here we would kind of predict a double whammy effect for them that um, on the one hand, again, the same gender stereotypes apply. So if as a man, I look more feminine rather than masculine, I might um, get lower job fit ratings here because of stereotypes, gender stereotypes, um, and also because of attractiveness stereotypes, because again, as a man, if I have more feminine facial features, I'm typically seen as less attractive compared to a man that has more masculine facial features. So these are the kind of more nuanced predictions that we wanted to test here. And we were especially interested in this first aspect in these predictions for women, because we would expect to see kind of opposite effects of this one facial features on our um, 
variable of interest here, so judgments of how good of an engineer that person would be. So we tested these hypotheses in a sample of 445 students from Tilburg University. Um, they were mostly female, um, but the gender of participants did not moderate any of the effects that I'll be showing you here. And again, like I said, we showed them the faces of different people, and for each of them, we asked them, okay, how successful do you think this person would be as an engineer on a scale from nine to 10? So the perceived fit of that person with the job of an engineer. And we manipulated the gender and gender typicality of the faces that we showed them. So we showed them 20 faces, everyone made 20 judgments, and 10 of them showed uh, men, 10 of them showed women, and for each of these 20 faces, we created a masculinized and a feminized version. So we used morphing software to morph each of these 20 faces with a typically male face or a typically female face. And you can see what that looked like here. So you can see that these, these changes in facial appearance were very subtle. So these are not, I don't know, caricatures. Um, these really look still like real people. Um, and you can see though that on the right, you see the more masculine version. You see that the eyebrows are a bit more pronounced, the jawline is stronger, and the face is a bit wider. So these are typically masculine facial features that are exaggerated here, whereas the opposite facial features, the opposite manipulation was made for the face on the left, which looks more feminine than the um, original face, which is not shown here. Okay, so let's go to the results. So I already mentioned that we basically made two assumptions here. So we made two assumptions that on the one hand, we will see um, a gender effect. So we think there are gender stereotypes that men are seen as better engineers than women. And this is also what we found here. And on the other hand, we also expected there to be this attractiveness stereotype that more attractive looking people on average will be seen as better engineers. And that's also what we found here. Um, but what we were most interested in is, okay, what was the effect of our manipulation of facial femininity here? And remember, for women, we had these competing predictions, which we can actually both detect in our data. So on the one hand, we expected that women with feminine rather than masculine facial features would be seen as more attractive. And as you saw, attractive people were seen as better engineers. So we would expect a positive indirect effect here. Um, and that's also what we found. So women with more feminine facial features were rated as better engineers. But actually, we would also predict if we control for attractiveness, that there should be a negative effect because of these gender stereotypes. So more feminine looking women were also seen as worse engineers here. So both of these stereotypes seem to be activated. And for this reason, we did not really have a strong prediction for the total effect that we would observe for facial femininity here, because depending on how strong these stereotypes are, they might actually cancel each other out and we might observe a null effect. Um, we did observe a significant effect here, which was negative, which sort of suggests that maybe the gender stereotypes are more um, strongly applicable or more relevant here for people's judgments when they judge how well different people fit into the role of an engineer. Now for men, um, we had slightly different predictions. Um, we predicted a negative indirect effect of feminine facial features because um, feminine looking men are seen as less attractive than masculine looking men. Um, that's also what we found. So um, they kind of receive the penalty um, in terms of job fit ratings as an engineer because um, the feminine facial features made them look less attractive. And it was also because the same gender stereotype applies here. Um, there was also a negative direct effect of the facial cue on these ratings. So overall, feminine men were rated as feminine looking men were rated as less um, good engineers, as worse engineers than masculine looking men. Okay, so what does this actually tell us? So on the one hand, it kind of shows that gender typical facial features can trigger multiple and sometimes even conflicting, in the case of women here, um, sometimes conflicting stereotypes that both together determine people's judgments. So on average, these effects might actually wash out. So if we would have just looked at the overall effect of feminine versus masculine facial features, we could have observed the null effect and maybe concluded, okay, really how masculine and feminine people look have nothing to do here with these job fit ratings. 
Um, that's not what we observed. So one stereotype seemed to be stronger than the other. But um, again, this, this would have been a plausible hypothesis here of an overall null effect. And we might have concluded, okay, this, this Q doesn't matter, even though it's just not, the overall effect is just not there because these stereotypes cancel each other out. Um, now we also replicated the same effects for a typically female job. So we asked participants for the same images, how uh, good of a nurse would this person be? And we observed kind of the same predicted pattern of effects here. Um, and currently we're also running another follow-up where we ask participants to judge um, which of these people they would favor as a leader in a work. I mean, so we tell them, okay, there's this group of consultants um, you have to choose or you have to hire a person to supervise them. Which of these people would you prefer? And we would pretty much have the same predictions as for the typically male job here. So that study is running right now. And I'm curious if we can replicate it a third time. Okay, are there any questions so far? No. There are. Should I? Yeah. Um, there are some related to your study. So maybe it's uh, best to look at those. Um, yes. Let me see. Why would attractiveness be related to success as an engineer? Uh, the OFIT literature would suggest that maybe typical peaky faces would be related yeah. to the OFIT in this domain. Yeah, so that may be explained. So, I mean, on the one hand, um, if you look at the literature, if you look at the effect of attractiveness on personality inferences, you see that across the board, more attractive people are expected to have better personalities. They're pretty much expected to be better people. Um, for the specific job of an engineer, I could see that um, maybe another example would be a computer programmer that, okay, maybe we expect them to be uh, more geeky, not so um, popular and maybe less attractive. Um, I could totally see that, that that could have worked out too based on the literature showing that we ascribe all sorts of per, um, more uh, positive personality traits to them. Um, we thought it was more likely that attractive people will actually be seen as, as um, better engineers here as well. But I agree with you that that um, hypothesis was maybe not as strong as the, the general hypothesis here. And that's also what maybe the data show that um, even though we did find that positive effect of attractiveness overall, the gender stereotypes um, seem to have been stronger here. Okay. Um, a different question is, is there any effect of the participant sex? This is by Shirley. Yeah, there, there were no, so participant sex did not moderate any of these effects here whatsoever. Okay. And how about a female leader job? So not nurse, but for example, head of a female magazine. Yeah, um, so that, that's a really good question. And um, right now we, we started running this study. Um, so this is a student project for a master thesis where we looked at, or where we were interested in looking at um, leader selection and we um, we kind of um, figured that, okay, in general, leadership is um, typically associated with, with maleness. Um, so we also, as a first test, focused on this relatively typically male domain of consulting, business consulting. Um, but in a follow-up study, we also want to see whether maybe what kind of leadership style people are expecting from a leader. If you, um, you have more of a democratic versus autocratic leadership style, maybe there are different gender norms that play a role here. Or as you mentioned, um, maybe in a domain where we would expect um, female leaders to be better um, if there's more, I don't know, social support that is needed rather than you know, more top-down decision-making. So we might expect different patterns here depending on what kind of gender norms are they. Yeah, so more to come. Uh, yeah. um, let me see, there are still some uh, clarification questions more. Um, the fa um, so this that previous question was from Daphne, by the way. Um, some clarification questions from Reinhardt. Uh The face on the right looked bigger. Face on the right? Yeah, that might be my, my poor cutting skills in, in uh, inserting these images into the presentation. So. Um, the faces are, are standardized in, um, in how large they are. Um, it does not mean that facial width to height ratio, for example, might not be different. So you can see that the face of the masculinized version was a bit wider. So this is um, basically a kind of holistic manipulation of facial masculinity. So different aspects of the face are different between those two, um, between those two exemplars. Okay. 
Okay. Um, and there was another one from Reinhardt as well, uh, who asked, how do you define success as an engineer? Yeah. Um, so one, one thing we thought about while designing this study is, um, because we were interested in gender stereotypes, we were a bit, un a bit unsure on how to measure these job fit ratings. So we didn't want to straight out ask people, okay, do you think um, women can be good engineers or can only men be? So we didn't want to be that obvious. Um, so um, what we did in the end was ask this question of um, how successful do you think this person is in finding a job as, a, as an engineer at a top firm? Um, so this has been used before in the literature and um, I think the, the exact way the instructions were phrased were that um, we're going to show you pictures of different individuals. They all graduated with really good grades from a, a certain engineering program, from a top engineering program. They're all going to look for a job um, at top engineering companies in the next um, year. How likely do you think it is that this person will find a job in the next six months, which is something that not everyone can do. So we tried to have this maybe more indirect measurement of um, how much these people fit into the typical image of a successful engineer that will get a, a job at a really good firm. Of course, it doesn't mean that uh, participants themselves endorse these stereotypes. It might simply mean that they um, think there are these stereotypes out there that recruiters from these companies are influenced by gender stereotypes. Okay, Okay. so it was really more about are people likely to hire them, then will they really be effective as, uh, as engineers then, if I understand? Yeah, so of course we, we got um, um, this is basically the same when we run these studies and we ask people to judge personality based on faces or make any decisions based on faces. Um, some comments we get from participants as well. How am I going to do this? I, I can only see their face. There's no way that I can judge a person's personality. What am I even going to rely on? Um, of course, we know that ultimately they still seem to rely on the same cues in the end. So that there does seem to be some, some shared process that is going on, some shared stereotype. Um, but yeah, um, of course, well, this, we have the same here that people say, well, I don't really know. Um, I think my, my responses are pretty random. I had no clue what to rely on. And yet we see that, for example, certain cues like facial femininity and masculinity hey, here have the predicted effects. Um, but yeah, of course, this is kind of a very basic um, setting to maybe get at um, the effect of gender stereotypes or the effect of attractive stereotypes on people's judgments here. Um, there are definitely more ecologically valid ways of, of testing this, um, asking, for example, in a, in a hiring paradigm of... Um, um, whether they want to hire this person and also show them different information on their CV maybe. Um, but given that this was kind of the, the first study we tried, we wanted to do a, a very simple setup to see if we can find a predictive pattern in this more simple version first. Mm -hmm. Lucia, I'm not quite sure if you were at the end of your presentation or wanted to take questions in between. Um, you still have more I'm, I'm fine you... with either. So, um, okay. I can... Go on. So I think if, if um, something is really unclear based on what I'm describing and um, maybe that, that prevents you from kind of following the rest, following the results, then feel free to just barge in and unmute yourself and, and ask a question. Um, if, if there are, I don't know, larger questions that need maybe a bit more discussion, um, we, we could also leave those to the end. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's leave those to the end then and continue first. Okay, sounds good. Um, so this was basically one way where we wanted to test um, or where we wanted to show that maybe this, this simple model of how we study the influence of facial appearance on decision making is maybe a bit too simplistic. We might miss out on the fact that multiple inferences become activated, multiple stereotypes become activated when we perceive a person's face, which then co-determine people's decisions. And in the second um, study that I want to show you, um, we focused on a different complexity, which is the fact that um, we not only perceive how feminine or masculine a person is, but we perceive their entire face, which gives us information about um, very different kinds of features, very different kinds of cues that we might rely on to form inferences. And of course, that can have downstream consequences for the kind of decisions we're making based on facial appearance. So what we wanted to do in this project is to 
figure out which facial cues are actually central, which are the most informative cues if we want to predict um, participants' for personality impressions from faces, so how trustworthy or dominant, for example, they perceive others to be. So just to give you an example, um, why I think the way we typically study the influence of facial appearance is a bit too simplistic, and we're missing out on more complex relationships here. So one cue that has been studied a lot in the literature is facial width to height ratio. So um, different people have measured facial width to height ratio in faces and maybe manipulated in faces. So you can see the person on the right has a slightly wider face. And for example, one finding that has consistently emerged from these studies is that facial width to height ratio correlates with perceived trustworthiness. So wider faces are typically perceived as less trustworthy than people with narrower faces. And people have made more general claims based on this finding. So they've claimed that um, people rely on this cue to form trustworthiness impressions. This is an important cue in impression formation. And this actually is a good thing because supposedly facial width to height ratio is a somewhat valid cue to a person's trustworthiness. I and mean, this is heavily contested, but um, this is, um, some people make this claim. Um, so this actually allows people, because they rely on facial width to height ratio, this allows them to form somewhat accurate impressions of other people's trustworthiness. But of course, there are also other findings out there. So there are a lot of findings showing that um, how much a face resembles an expression of happiness is positively correlated with their perceived trustworthiness. And again, we have theories that build on these findings and claim, for example, that people rely on this cue, that this is an important one in impression formation. And that's, again, important for more general theories of impression formation because um, supposedly all these impressions are, are products of an oversensitive emotion detection system. So we're so, um, so much looking for different emotion expressions because they're so informative for our social lives that we even see emotions in neutral faces, which kind of drives the um, personality impressions that we form when we see a person's face. So the problem with, I think, many of these studies is that they often study these cues in isolation. So they only focus on facial width to height ratio, or they only focus on resemblance to a happy expression. But of course, when we perceive a face, we perceive variation across all of these different dimensions simultaneously. And the big problem here is that these dimensions might all be correlated somehow. And we know that many of these dimensions are correlated. So it's really hard to disentangle their unique effects here. Even if you manipulate facial width to height ratio, you are changing perceptions of how um, masculine the person looks or how baby faced that person looks. So even if you manipulate this one feature, you are not really getting the effect of facial width to height ratio only, but you're also observing the effect of all these other dimensions. So it's a bit of a statistical challenge to disentangle all these effects. And maybe another shortcoming of previous studies is that often certain dimensions have been held constant. So for example, um, if I want to investigate the, the relationship between facial width to height ratio and perceptions of trustworthiness, maybe I only look at white, relatively young male targets. Um, but that means that yeah, facial width to height ratio might predict these impressions in this situation. But in real life, when I also see their gender, age, and race, maybe these are way more important bases for my impressions. So I don't rely on facial width to height ratio anymore because I have way more Im important information to rely on now. So these are all reasons for why finding out which of these facial features are actually central for judgment and decision making is um, really hard from a statistical perspective. And we tried to tackle this problem by um, using data from the Chicago Face Database, which is a really nice um, database if you're into studying facial appearance. So on the one hand, it's nice because it has a very large set of very diverse faces. So we have, um, they're all American, but um, we have men and women. We have um, people from different races, different age groups. And this database also comes with a lot of different um, kinds of variables. There's a large data set behind this data, behind this um, face database. So we have already personality impressions of these faces that were 
provided by a large set of, of raters that were recruited from MTurk. So we have the average perceived trustworthiness and dominance of these people. And our goal in this project was which facial features, um, we want to identify the facial features which are best at predicting the perceived trustworthiness and dominance of all these targets here. And as I said, there's a lot of different variables contained in this database. So we have demographic features such as um, self-reported gender, age, and race. We have uh, ratings on how much these faces resemble different emotion expressions or how much, um, how gender typical or race typical a person looks. And we also have a lot of morphological features that were objectively measured from the face images. So for example, facial width to height ratio and cheekbone prominence. So this is a very good um, collection of variables that have been studied as determinants of the kinds of impressions and behaviors that we see in response to a person's facial appearance. So our goal was to see which predictors here do the best job at predicting people's trustworthiness and dominance impressions, which facial features are um, in fact central in impression formation if we model faces along all of these dimensions at the same time. And the way we did this is we first of all looked at how these four different categories of predictors, so emotion resemblances, statistical, demographic, and morphological features, how well each of these category does at predicting trustworthiness impressions. Um, and we specifically looked on the left here at the root mean squared error, uh, so the discrepancy between the predicted trustworthiness impressions based on these four models and the actual trustworthiness impressions. So this is a measure of how good our models were in predicting these values. And um, of course, we're modeling a lot of different variables here, which um, will run into a problem of overfitting. So we also use cross-validation. So we always had a random training data set on which these models were estimated. And then we tested their performance on a separate um, set of data. So on the test data set to see how good they actually are in predicting model data. And what we found was that overall the emotions model was superior than the other three models in predicting trustworthiness impressions. And actually the morphological model, which has the most variables and also facial width to height ratio, for example, did the worst here. Um, we also looked at a more maybe traditional measure um, of explained variance. So we could adjust it R squared and there we basically see the same pattern of results so emotion resemblances explained most variance in trustworthiness impressions and morphological features explained the least variance here. And we actually see the same pattern for dominance impressions, although the differences between the four different categories of predictors were less pronounced here, but still emotion resemblances were most predictive of dominance impressions, whereas morphological features were least predictive. Now, the way we put all of these variables into different categories is maybe a bit arbitrary. So um, we try to look at the literature and see what kind of features people are typically studying or typically examining here. Um, and based on these, we included all these variables. But um, maybe you might think that, okay, now gender typicality and a person's gender are in different categories, which is maybe a bit weird. So we also wanted to kind of circumvent the arbitrariness of putting these variables into different categories. So we wanted to estimate a model in which we put all of these variables into one model at the same time. So we wanted to model faces along all of these different um, dimensions simultaneously. Now, again, this is um, a huge problem in of um, maybe overfitting the data. So we again use cross-validation here to look at the predictive power of each of these um, predictors of each of these facial features. And we also used elastic net regression, which is a form of regularized um, regression models, which tries to come up with not only the most predictive model, but also the most parsimonious model. So variables that don't explain a lot of variance are shrunk in this model, are decreased, reduced, um, to come up with a more parsimonious model that might be more predictive for the for new data. So basically, we did this based again on training data and then tested the predictive performance of this model on the test data to see 
how can we identify on the one hand a parsimonious model that kind of focuses on the most important variables here to kind of show us which variables are most important, um, but also uh, while not kind of sacrificing the predictive power of the overall model. So what we found was basically this pattern. So you can see the effect of each of these variables on trustworthiness impressions here. You can basically um, interpret these coefficients like normal um, regression coefficients. Um, so the larger away from zero it is, the, the more important it was for predicting people's trustworthiness impressions. Um, you can see all these different colorful dots. They all represent one round, one iteration of cross-validation. And you can see that the dark, the bigger dark dots, this, this is the mean importance of these variables, the mean um, predictive power of these variables across all these different iterations. So what you see again here is that the emotional resemblances, how much faces resemble um, happy or angry facial expressions, were most predictive Whereas again, facial width to height ratio, for example, a facial feature that receives a lot of attention in the literature was a very uninformative predictor. And we actually see the same pattern if we look at um, our model that predicted dominance impressions. So again, the resemblances to emotion expressions were the most predictive variables here, whereas facial width to height ratio was relatively uninformative for understanding what people rely on to form these dominance impressions. Okay, so what these results basically show is that if we model faces along all of these dimensions that people perceive that people can extract when they see a person's face, um, we actually find that some variables and some classes of variables are more informative than others. So it seems like emotional resemblances are more important um, facial features that people rely on to form trustworthiness and dominance impressions on faces. And that might, might also have downstream consequences for how these facial features um, influence different kinds of behaviors and decisions that we might be interested in. And we also see that some facial features which have received a lot of attention in the literature, like facial width to height ratio, are actually relatively uninformative if we, in fact, model faces along all of these dimensions simultaneously. Okay. So just to sum up what I just showed you, um, basically what I wanted to demonstrate or suggest is that this simplistic way of focusing on a single facial cue or maybe two facial cues and looking at the kind of inferences people make um, to, to figure out which facial appearances um, have effects on decision making, it might miss out on some more complex relationships between facial appearance and decision making. So on the one hand, I showed you that um, the same facial features, so facial femininity or masculinity, can trigger multiple stereotypes, and these might sometimes conflict, but together they determine certain um, judgment decision-making that we're interested in. And um, second, that if we model faces along all these different interrelated, interrelated dimensions, um, some facial features turn out to be more important for impression formation than others, um, which means that they are really the ones that, that drive um, these effects of facial appearance on um, judgment and decision making that we observe. And maybe one um, final conclusion from this is that um, more complex models that acknowledge these, these complexities in these um, judgment processes, in these face perception processes, um, might be better suited in getting at these more complex relationships between a person's facial appearance and what kinds of judgment decisions people are making based on their facial features. Okay, so that was it. Um, thanks a lot for your attention, and I think we still have plenty of time for questions. Let me put me on. Yeah, so let's um, yeah clap first. <laughs> <laughs> In synchrony, that's difficult. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, uh, Bastian, for a really cool presentation. I still have lots of questions in here for you. I was yes. wondering, can you see the questions yourself as well? Or uh, Yes, let me see. where. I thought maybe Simon's one is a good one to start because it's quite specific mm -hmm. about your presentation. Stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, Simon, you're, you're completely right. So the, these were only linear effects we were looking at. Um, I think we also ran a model where we included quadratic effects for some predictors. So especially um, if we look at age, for example, um, so quadratic effects for age are pretty common in the literature. Um, 
that model took days to run and didn't convert in the end. So we're still looking for more uh, better better reverses of, of running this model um, because it, it is a very complex model if we do the, the if we implement the cross validation at the same time so we haven't really explored all these non linear relationships that that might be in the data and um, you're right that that might actually change which predictors are more important because they might not show a linear relationship with between with um, trustworthiness and dominance impressions here yeah and also interaction effects i see that you also mentioned that um, so there, there are, um, so we, we're kind of still looking into all these more complex relationships between all these variables. Um, so far, we, we didn't really find any um, large interaction effects, for example, for a variable that did not matter before um, versus that, that shows a large interaction effect with another variable. So there was nothing that, that really popped out, but yeah, we, we aren't really done exploring all this data yet. Very interesting. So I'm also curious, actually. Um, I mean, could there be could it be that they that you get for certain of these um, characteristics that they actually interact with cues that don't relate to the characteristic, right? So I mean, uh, you you could have a situation where you have an inference at the character level, and that affords the expression of of a certain. Uh, Q. I'm, I'm, I'm mostly thinking about sort of sociological perspectives on who gets to show certain emotions, right? Yeah. And how that uh, can be judged very differently. Yeah. I mean, there, there can be very, um, people might have different lay theories or different stereotypes that, that can be very complex here. So maybe um, a certain Q is perceived as very trustworthy among white people, but not among black people. Or you could imagine all sorts of different interaction effects. Um, I, I have to specifically think about like basic demographic features here of, of uh, men versus women or, or uh, different uh, racial categories. So yeah, you, you're completely right. And um, yeah, I, I think like, like I said, like there, there are many different things you could uh, look at here. These models take forever to run. So we haven't really fully explored all of these possibilities yet. Um, so far, what we looked at in terms of um, interaction effects and these higher order effects, for example, for age, there was nothing really interesting that that popped out that that kind of changed the interpretation of which features are particularly important interesting um, i'd like to prioritize slightly the uh questions by phd students as well just for uh uh other reasons so i also, see there's one here from all the questions you always feel free to to send me an email i'm i'm happy to to talk about this obviously it's my research <laughs> Yeah, there are lots of questions, so uh, I think we do have to prioritize a little bit. But there's one by Jian uh, Shi. Um, do you see that one? Are all facial, all the facial yeah. views, features in your study? Yeah, so we, we only looked at the, the static facial features here. So these were all things that, um, so for the database, they, they took these images, they had the photos for all the targets, and then they subsequently showed these photos to a very large sample of raiders and ask them, for example, um, how feminine does this person look? Um, how masculine does this person look? How um, babyish are the facial features? Um, how much does it How much does this person um, resemble an, an emotional expression of, of happiness? So they, they had all these different dimensions that were rated based on the static images. So this is you're right that this is only focused on the static cues and. Um, I mean, there are studies showing that, uh, for example, by Rachel Jack in Glasgow, showing that um, dynamic cues are also very important in impression formation. And um, it could be that, for example, dynamic emotion expressions might be more important than these, these static resemblances to emotion expressions here. Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, procedurally, if anyone wants to step in, like Simon just did, to say that the question was either answered well or, or not, feel free to do so, because I, <laughs> I think that should be, uh, should be okay. Um, there's another question from Art, who is, I guess, borderline uh, a PhD student, so I'll prioritize him as well. Uh, so what do, you make of, uh, what do you make of the emotions that have the strongest effects of the perception of trustworthiness? Um, and that anger and happiness are not really central to trustworthy behavior. So why yeah. do they pop up? Um, so what I kind of alluded to quickly was there's this theory that 
personality impressions from faces are a product of this oversensitive emotion detection system. So um, when we judge someone's trustworthiness, what we're trying to do is to assess their intentions. Um, so there have been studies looking at um, if we do a factor analysis of all of these personality impressions that we might be ask people for, um, two central dimensions that pop out are what are typically labeled trustworthiness and dominance. That's also why I focused on them here. But what they basically represent these dimensions are their evaluations of a person's intentions and their abilities. And when we look at trustworthiness, if, when we judge people's intentions, you could see that a smile is typically a signal of positive intentions, whereas an expression of anger is a signal of negative intentions. So this might be, does this person want to help or harm me? So this is what trustworthiness impressions basically boil down to. Is that clear? Art? <laughs> Art, does that answer your question? Yeah, so that definitely has more to do with how these labels are operationalized. Yeah. Which may be a bit misleading, I would say, then. To label them as trustworthiness, perhaps, but yeah. Yeah, so um, they're, they're they're labeled differently in the literature, which is a bit of a mess. So sometimes people refer to these um, dimensions as valence and dominance. And one um, one thing that that we found over and over again is that um, this valence dimension, which comprises judgments of trustworthiness, of sociability, of honesty, and all these kind of morality related traits. Um, so people interpret this as an evaluation of a person's intentions and the correlation between scores on this dimension, if we average across all of these different judgments, and scores on just the trustworthiness dimension, the correlation there is about 0 0.9 to 0.95. So if we just ask trust for trustworthiness impressions, this is a very good approximation of this overall underlying dimension of um, the evaluation of a, a person's intentions. So maybe another thing that, that, that I think where, where these results were interesting is that um, typically um, the role of emotion resemblance is, is studied particularly when studying um, trustworthiness impressions. So again, this, this angle of um, smiling versus scowling signals different intentions. So that's why these have an effect on trustworthiness impressions. But if you look at the literature of, on dominance, these typically focus more on other cues like facial width to height ratio, like facial masculinity. But you could see that for both trustworthiness and dominance in, um, impressions, these emotion resemblances were actually the most predictive features. So maybe they are not only central for trustworthiness impressions, but some have suggested, but also in general for, for our impressions of dominance as well. Great. I see a reaction by Art that this uh, was really helpful, uh, this answer, so I assume that that question is, uh, is answered. Um, uh, Reinhard, you had a, uh, also a question about how emotions were measured, which I think relates to this. Has your question been answered or do you, would you like to add something? Uh, my question has been answered uh, with respect to the measurement, yes. Uh, so maybe only did you also check mediation effect because that's, that's basically your model. Uh, so the objective measurement of the facial cues uh, and uh, mediation of the emotions. Yeah, we, we did not, so this is another um, maybe more complex relationship that we didn't look at yet. Um, so of course there, there, could be, um, there could be mediating effects here that um, if you are perceived as, if, if you have a larger facial width to height ratio, you are perceived as, as um, as resembling less uh, uh, happy expression and that might have an effect on trustworthiness impression. So like these higher order effects and interaction effects, um, it's not to say that these, um, there are no correlations between facial width to height ratio and trustworthiness impression because there, there definitely are for, for many of these variables, there are these zero order correlations or also um, probably indirect correlations via other variables. Um, but our goal was to see, okay, if we consider all of these cues, especially with an eye on these facial features that do receive a lot of attention in literature, people are basically saying these are the central ones that people rely on to form impressions. Um, our focus was on testing whether they're actually central predictors in this model here when we, when we model faces along all of these different dimensions.